Okay, good morning. Hello, everyone. Welcome to part two of metacognition. And I know I threw a lot at you on Wednesday. I wonder if there's any questions before we start. Maybe we can just say it's all a bit confusing right now. That's okay. Once we go over a few basic concepts, as always, we can then build on those. We talked about tapping into things that you already know. This is your experience with a really fancy word, metacognition. Oh, you mean focusing? Uh, yeah. Do you mean just trying to control your emotion? Yeah, okay. Ever been studying or reading and you put away your phone because you want to be distracted? That's just metacognition. You're just directing your mental states or trying to influence them in a certain way so that it's, it's beneficial for you. So it's awareness and control of your mental states. Just gave it a really technical word. So um, it involves higher order processes, awareness and control, pretty much anything internal. Cognition is usually focused in the past on external things, tasks, um, memory work is what brought people into the field of metacognition, realizing that people can actually have feelings about their own memory. You can feel that you know something before you even retrieve it. People thought that was pretty neat. How do you feel knowledge before you retrieve it? That uh, moved researchers into thinking about metacognition in general in terms of uh, attention, emotion, memory. Some people call it thinking about thinking. And sure, if, if you're uh, new to metacognition, we can talk about thinking about thinking and just kind of keep it like that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an introduction. But really, it's awareness and control of all the different parts of your your mind. And it's awareness and control of anything mental. Again, two parts, monitoring and control. And we do this for everything. You're monitoring me right now. You're trying to control your keyboard. You're aware of uh, the words that I'm speaking right now. You're aware of the light on the board and the symbols here. Uh, it's externally focused. But you can start to be aware if I'm saying anything important, like that'll be on the test. Oh, you're monitoring. Then tries to control external things so that you then uh, have access to something important later on, which is also a meta memory. You're inputting information so that you can then recall it later on. So monitoring and control are just basic processes we all have uh, experience with since we're all little babies. Every single moment, every single day when we're awake, we're monitoring and we're trying to control something. Um, and we're trying to monitor and control our own mental states a lot of the time. If we're wanting something to eat to boost our mood, if we're trying to uh, you know, get into a quiet place so we can study better. So these are things we already know. Monitoring the environment, controlling the environment, basic, uh, you know, children do this. Um, but this is a way of just priming your intuition so that you don't think metacognition is some... When you first hear the word, you're thinking, that sounds really dense. I'm not sure if I want to really uh, get into that. But when you're introduced to it, like, okay, these are things you do all the time. You're saying, oh, I know this. I knew what this was before I ever learned the word. Well, exactly. Sort of like you knew what gravity was before you ever learned what gravity was. We swim in it all the time. You're constantly aware of feelings and mental states. Are you feeling like this is interesting or that you're bored? That's also metacognition. You're aware of your mental states. Um, driving your thoughts in a certain way that's beneficial. Driving your emotions. Uh, in this case, this class is about trying to encode information so that you can then put it on a test or uh, write something you find interesting for the final assignment or maybe even find something useful uh, for life and, and living in general so you have a better understanding of your own mind and how to direct it beneficially. So these are just a basic general principle of intelligence. We'll talk about these domain general principles of intelligence. When you understand a system, you can control that system better. Uh, whether it's externally focused things, humans were originally blind to all the big puzzle pieces of the universe, chemistry, biology, and so we were just helplessly at the mercy of all the forces in the universe that we couldn't understand. 
Eventually, we started to understand those forces, and we started to control them better, whether it's uh, we were at, at the mercy of diseases that would just ravage and take away one-fourth of the population. Now we can understand what's happening, and we can control it a little better. Eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to cure all disease, but we don't understand that system yet fully. When we do, there's a good chance that we can eliminate disease, all of it, forever. Maybe. But this is one of the great promises of intelligence. It enables us to understand and control. It's something no other animal does. And anything you want to do in your life will require that you understand what you want, how to get it, and how to achieve these things, of course, within a moral context. But at some point, human thinking started to uh, focus on itself. Thought itself became the object of focus. And intelligence started to understand itself, started to direct its own processes inward. And intelligence, even externally focused, is one of the most powerful things that has ever evolved. And when it starts to direct its own processes, its own power on itself, you get this higher order power that enables us to uh, engage in scientific progress, um, understand in just a few centuries more than all the previous generations combined. And instead of just um, thinking that the wheel was a pretty neat invention, we can direct our thinking rationally and clear up uh, how dark the universe seems. And we can shine a light into all the corners that we never had any understanding of before. And that is the power of metacognition if we're talking about reasoning. If we're talking about just directing your own, your own mind in a beneficial way, if you're feeling distracted, you can learn attention training that you can then direct onto anything with a laser focus. This is hard, but it, it is one of the most beneficial things you can do. Because if you learn attention in general, you can then direct it on anything. If you learn uh, emotional control and um, ways of decreasing negative emotions, ways of decreasing dysphoria, ways of decreasing anxiety, you can then uh, direct that anywhere in life. We talked about memory training. Hope you enjoyed that clip from Sherlock yesterday. I imagine you spent the evenings building your own mind palace. <laughs> but these techniques, these ways of uh, these instructions for directing your mind beneficially, uh, just engage with our neurons in a way that activates their, their, their greater potential. So as we talked about, superior memory and, you know, world champions of memorizing things didn't come from some sort of innate brain structure. They weren't born memory champions, but they were uh, learning meta-memory techniques that enabled them to have a higher order power. So if you could memorize maybe, ah, uh, who knows, at best 20, 20 cards in a row, you know, decks of cards, uh, that's probably my limit. How many more did we say uh, somebody with the right meta-memory training could learn? Twice as much? 10 times as much? 30,000. What, what higher order of power is that from learning the right instructions? Right. So memory uh, can be multiplied many times over. Reasoning, which humans have innately, if you know the formal rules, can unlock all the secrets of the universe and, and learn to direct our well-being uh, better. Attention, we all have, but if you learn how to have a laser focus, you can then direct it towards anything and, 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 uh, and benefit that way. So we talked about how metacognition uh, connects with these levels that have, we have been harping on since the beginning of this course. Well, we have neurons that, you know, uh, that, uh, that do the actual processing of, of algorithms. These are pretty standard in terms of what we're all born with. The symbol level is what we learn, and we can learn object level knowledge about reality facts or instructions of how to, you know, we learn about the world or how to engage with it, such as, you know, driving a car. But then we also learn meta knowledge, ways of directing your attention, ways of directing your emotions, ways of, um, of monitoring your own feelings better. So, Meta-knowledge, or a meta-representation, acts 
in the ways that uh, knowledge interacts with our system in general. It moves into a buffer, this conscious now state, this working memory. It then activates productions, procedural rules, or procedural knowledge, that then um, attains the, the meta-level goal, which is attention. Oh, you have you know knowledge for how to direct your attention well? It activates productions for directing your attention better. And as you practice, more and more procedural knowledge gets trained, and you can then engage in it more automatically, it improves. Metacognition itself can become a skill, and we're going to talk about that later. And, um, of course, you can never get too many of these animations. We talked about basic system one processes of just production rules, acting through working memory, just automatic, ballistic, outside of working memory. You know, we can control our attention in an, in an automatic way, but then we can um, uh, use knowledge of on the on the object level to to direct object level tasks. Again, moves into working memory just like everything else, and then it dire then it directs procedural knowledge to do external tasks, driving a car or making your breakfast or uh, finding your way here today, engaging with your computer right now. You have knowledge directing your processes. But then there's this other level by which meta-knowledge, again, does the same thing, engages with our system to achieve meta-level states. I have better attention, emotion, memory, uh, even better mo uh, metacognitive monitoring. So this is one way of, of understanding uh, how metacognition works. Now, children have metacognition naturally. They, everyone has seen children learn emotional control techniques, usually from dangling a cookie or something in front of them, or say a marshmallow. Anyone remember the marshmallow test? Yeah. I'm going to play a clip from that, and you're going to take a metacognitive lens, and you're going to look at this, and you're going to see children automatically trying to control their emotions, trying to control their attention. They're told by a researcher very cruelly that uh, here's a marshmallow. You can eat it now, but if you wait, I think five minutes, 10 minutes, you'll get two marshmallows. And so some of those kids go, sounds great, and they just eat it right away. And some of them wait, and they're controlling, controlling their emotional states and their attention. To so what did you notice there? Some people had natural more self-control. Some people had less of it. I don't think I would do very well. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So you saw them not just controlling their emotions, but controlling their attention. Anyway. This experiment was actually used to judge the delayed grad. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was used to prove that children who were able to wait for the second marshmallow actually tended to be much more successful. Right, so there's another word for that, delayed gratification. How do they achieve delayed gratification? Metacognitive control. I don't want to look at it. I'm just going to need that second marshmallow. Yep. You looked, yeah. Well, you can tell there's an effort there. There's there's some mental muscle going on. They just ate it, yeah. My favorite story about that was that there was one kid that opened it up, ate the middle, closed it. Yeah. <laughs> and the researchers, and their what researchers could see this on video, and they're just like, keep an eye on that kid. <laughs> But yeah, so um, humans naturally are given this ability to direct their direct their minds in a way that's uh, that's. I mean, this is a system one aut automaticity. The kids had this feeling, right? They wanted the marshmallow, and some kids just let that direct their productions, and they just ate it immediately. Some kids had metacognitive control, and this is dual system metacognition, not cognition, metacognition, where there is a controlling of mental states. Um, but it's automatic. It's non-conceptual. Now, if you told kids you need to control yourself, you need to wait, uh, you need to um, control your attention, control attention, control emotions here, then that's that's conceptually based metacognition. So researchers have found that there is this double nature of metacognition. Researchers have found there's a double nature in that just like system one, system two cognition, metacognition has this automaticity non-conceptual feeling-based automaticity or this concept-driven um, 
metacognitive control. So epistemic feelings, such as a feeling of knowing or a feeling of, of um, from social cues, I should control how I act, um, can just automatically control your, your actions, such as if you're in a room and you just skip from social cues that you should focus on that person talking. Non-conceptual, but it controls your mental processes in a way that enables you to direct your attention. Now, if somebody were to tell you, uh, you know, we need to be quiet and focus on what that uh, researcher is saying or uh, what that person is, is trying to express, then that's conceptually driven metacognition, where concepts are driving your mental actions. So just like thinking fast, thinking slow, system one metacognition is considered quick and automatic, not requiring working memory, but in the cognitive architecture, it does require working memory in a minimal way. So this is one way that a computational definition does digress from the old system one, system two framework, which is one thing we wrote a, a paper about recently, but computational definitions are getting clear on what system two actually means using working memory for effortful metacognitive control that are more slow, more effortful, and more rule-based. Now, system one feelings, research uh, shows that epistemic feelings, also called noetic feelings, drives memory search. So a subject will take more time to search their memory if they feel they know it. So this is something we were all built with. Every human being was built with um, this, this ability to do memory search depending on whether they feel they have knowledge or not. So if you think about it, it would be pretty costly energetically if you had to search your entire memory for knowledge, for anything somebody asked you about. So instead, we get these quick shortcuts of feelings to decide whether we should bother to try retrieving knowledge. We do this all the time. So if I said, who invented the telephone? You might get a feeling of, oh, I know this. Give me a second. I'm going to search my memory. Is everyone getting a feeling? Who invented the telephone? Okay, who invented the light bulb? Ah, you are getting a feeling of knowing, and that's driving your memory search. Give me a second. I have a feeling that it's in there. Was it the same guy? Edison and his team. Right, see, you're tortured by a feeling. Feelings of knowing. Noetic feelings, exactly, and it's fun. So notice that you had a feeling there that drove whether you were going to spend more time searching a memory. Now notice how you have no feeling if I say, what was the seventh dinosaur ever discovered? And there's no feeling there. And you know it's not there. You don't even have to try to search for it. You get a quick so shortcut. If you do know this, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm very impressed. But you, I, I have no idea. This is This is a classic thing from a textbook about how if I were to ask you, you get a shortcut feeling that no, there's nothing there. Anything in your memory that you've learned at some point that you've recorded will have some associated feeling that you know it. Sometimes you can be wrong, but generally, noetic feelings, epistemic feelings are a good signal of your, your information. So that tip of the tongue feeling, we all know that. Who is that actor? Christian Bale. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you did? You, do, you looked up the seventh dinosaur? What is it? If the T-Rex was the seventh? Okay, well now if I were to ask you that in a year, you're going to have a feeling of knowing. Thank you. The T-Rex, eh? okay. That's great. So, uh, so we, we all have this experience of metacognition, and now we're putting words to it. So when you have a feeling of metacognition, and then I'm giving you words to describe it, uh, there's a researcher called Proust who says those are being enriched. So you're conceptually enriching feelings and an experience you already have. So if you're learning about your mind in general, usually it's mapping onto your experience. So we all have this rich landscape of experience of our own mental states inside of us. The science of metacognition and the research on it gives you words to create a conceptual symbolic map. It helps you engage with that landscape better. Cognitive behavior therapy is a, is a way of of doing that as well, where you learn that well, your feelings aren't automatically right, your thoughts aren't automatically right, feelings of knowing aren't always automatically right, 
Um, and you can learn techniques for engaging in your, in your mental states better. You can stop your thoughts and just have it instead of having just obsessive automatic thoughts, you can, uh, have emotional calming techniques so that you don't roil in anger or sadness forever. There's a way of, of getting yourself out of certain emotional and conceptual valleys to stop certain patterns of negative feelings and thoughts. Go ahead. Yeah. He said like to be right. It can be an accurate signal of knowledge or not. Sure, sure. Yes, so familiarity can, can be a way that it's wrong. So you may know a lot about dinosaurs and you think, I, I should know that. What's the 16th dinosaur? Because we all know what the 7th is. Uh, so a feeling of familiar, familiarity can activate, you know, neural pathways that can give you a, a false feeling that you know. Yeah. Uh, also, there are false feelings of know, knowing is, uh, false feelings of knowing can come from instead of thinking that the signal is coming from inside of you, thinking that you're getting some signal from outside of you. You know, you know that there's some situation external to you because you had a feeling. Um, that's when it's almost always wrong. You know somebody was saying something bad about you, or you know that somebody is lying, or you, you, you know that the blackjack, whatever, or is going to land on your number, or this is the this is the winning lottery ticket. I have a feeling. I have a feeling. Oh yes, this is the one. Are you psychic? Do you a clairvoyant? No. These feelings are wrong, and so understanding that your feelings of knowing are more often than not right if they're internally based and more often than not wrong if you direct them externally. So you need to gain conceptual evidence. Meta representation. This, this is an actual test from a kid who answers a question, which child has more money? And he writes Bobby. And then the teacher says, how do you know? Show your thinking. And he shows his thinking there. <laughs> That's yeah. Metacognition there. That is a meta representation. See, kids can conceptually understand that they have thoughts and other people have thoughts. And this is the idea of a meta representation, also called meta knowledge. It's a representation thought bubble that refers to a cognitive property. This is a thought. This is a feeling. Those are two different things. You can represent them. Um, you can have uh, what well, we've been talking about, uh, cognitive properties since the beginning of class. Those, a lot of those were meta-representations. So it just as a symbol, we talked about a symbol can be about something, like a stop sign is about stopping. Green means go, red means stop. And meta-representation is about itself or a cognitive property, which is self-encapsulated in this sense. So it can refer to its own attributes. This sentence has 22 letters. That's, that's meta. It refers to its own attributes. These are symbols. What are we referring to? We're talking about words. We're talking about the English language. These are all symbols. Meta, it represents itself. It can also refer to its own mental cognitive attributes. Cognition is computation. I learn better in the morning. Oh, my feelings are of knowing, my feelings of knowing aren't necessarily correct just because I feel them. Or they're more correct if they're about my knowledge, but less so about the external world. Now you're gaining meta representations that express your own cognitive attributes. Any questions about that? Yeah. It's declarative memory, it's facts, but uh, that's why we represent it. Green as external, blue as internal. But yeah, it's the same declarative symbolic representations that are about itself or about a cognitive property. So it's a clear knowledge about your own thinking? Yeah, or your own feelings or anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yep. If you get a feeling of truth, that's, that's not a meta representation, I should clarify. A conceptual, like a feeling is not declarative. It's a different format of information. A feeling 
we can call it uh, metadata, we can call it um, a, you know, a featural based property, we can call it something else, but it is not a symbolic concept the way a stop sign is or the way this text on a screen is. Uh, system two conceptual symbols are propositionally structured, um, you know, they're, they're about something else in a, in a clear semantic way. Feelings are more low level. They're, they're less complex. They have a different qualitative, uh, salience and, um, feelings are non-conceptual. So that's why system one is called non-conceptual. System two is conceptual. And so this is one way that Proust, um, Distinguishes system one and system two metacognition. System one, feeling based. System two, conceptual based. Yep. So, like, the feeling would be like. Yeah. Would be the idea of. That I'm sad, exactly, as you said it. So, there's a feeling, and then with somebody to ask you, hey, you go, well, why the long face? And you say, I'm, I'm feeling sad. Now you're creating conceptual representations to represent that. Ever, ever been annoyed or just frustrated? Maybe you haven't had lunch yet. You had some feelings inside of you and somebody says, how you feeling? Now you're conceptually expressing or enriching your system one feelings. So two different kinds of information, two different levels of cognition and metacognition. So uh, there was a researcher who, who first distinguished between object level and meta level, external object, internal, meta. So object level representations refer to a physical state. Think of those little green boxes. Meta level representations refer to a cognitive state. Focus or motion. Think of the little blue boxes. They are declarative concepts. They're just about a different category of phenomena. Yep. Absolutely. We do this all the time. Exactly. So now we're putting words to our, our universal experience. So we're creating a conceptual map for the landscape inside of us that we all have. This is one of the first times in history we're doing this. People have always just been engaging with their feelings and their inner landscape implicitly and not particularly effectively. Uh, and so uh, meta-level instructions can give you conceptually clear understanding of what's happening inside of you and you can then direct your internal states in a positive way. Usually when people feel some negative emotion, they have some automatic response to it that's not particularly um, beneficial to them. Or they have anger, they have some automatic response to it that, that actually just compounds it, makes it worse. And so there are techniques for decreasing negative feelings, decreasing anxiety, de decreasing some maybe some nameless dysphoria you have. There are, there are instructions for improving your, your mental states. So these instructions involve metacognitive control. Meta-knowledge can represent facts about cognition, such as the need to focus or the need to control uh, an emotion. You can have facts about cognition like, oh, I'm, my brain is made out of neurons. There are operations acting on representations. Facts, sort of like Paris is the capital of France, uh, if we're thinking about external things. But instructions refer to how to focus, how to control an emotion, how to build a mental palace so that you can uh, remember things more effectively, or how to direct your thoughts rationally so you can gain this higher order power. So facts and instructions. Instructions. That's where the gold is. So uh, we talked about this last time about how you can engage in your thinking, uh, for such as Thoughts are not reality. Use evidence. Maybe some people think, uh, you know, everyone hates me. Do you have any actual evidence for that? Or, oh, uh, my life is a catastrophe. And then uh, a behavior therapist or a cognitive therapist will help you go through them and say, well, let's, let's, let's explore that. Here's all the great things you've done. What makes you think it's a catastrophe? And then you can reframe that so that you can see all your successes. See how well you've done so far. And you can um, have a narrative that facilitates you better. You can have um, emotional instructions, such as observing your feelings uh, and be aware of the momentary impermanence, keeps you from automatically reacting to it. 
So we're going to talk about this in terms of detached mindfulness in a moment. Metacognitive therapy is even one step back from cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, it involves metacognitive beliefs. These are considered to be a precursor to actually directing your thoughts beneficially. You have to realize it's a good thing. This is something you can do. This is a belief. A belief about your metacognition. This is something you can control. You are innately skilled at. You have been given this ability as a human being. And so believing you can control your thoughts, believing you can control your emotional states in a beneficial way is a therapeutic technique that enables you to then go about this process and has been even seen to be, in some cases, more effective than cognitive behavior therapy. So this is also being considered the future of therapy and the future of, well, how humans interact with their own minds. So metacognitive therapy is being used to modify thinking processes, such as challenging metacognitive beliefs, such as I can't control my emotions, I can't get out of this negative feeling or pattern of thinking, I can't get out of this this pattern of thinking of of uh, of you know that I'm no good or that I I'm never going to achieve anything. Or uh, you can develop new ways of controlling your attention. I know it's possible. I know I can do it. I just need to go about the actual practice. And it enables you to um, to gain the motivation and a correct understanding that you are competent and able to direct your own mind beneficially. And it's good for you, and it's probably the most beneficial thing and useful thing you can learn to do. Detached mindfulness. This is something that began in an Eastern context, but then was rigorously put through the lens of uh, scientific uh, scrutiny and was shown to be one of the most beneficial ways of engaging with emotions. Sorry, I see a hand up. I was going to ask, Lucy, like, when I'm in therapy, it's like when they say you can't control your first thought, but your second thought that comes after and you can't. Sure. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Maybe you have some automatic thoughts, and so you might have the belief, I can't stop my automatic thoughts. But if you get this, what you just said, if you get this um, framing from a therapist saying, okay, maybe you can't control your first thought, your second thought, you can. You can control your reaction to thoughts. How? You can improve your, for example, detached mindfulness. So if you have some first negative feeling, usually people will have some second negative feeling, also called a meta emotion. I'm sad about feeling sad. Well, now I'm really upset about feeling sad that I'm sad. Well, now I'm just catastrophizing the fact that I'm sad about feeling sad, and this is just making me anxious. Now I'm really depressed about the fact that I'm anxious that I'm sad. So meta emotions can just continue ad nauseum and consume people. And so say we have some emotional state in our experience that will then create automatic negative emotions as a result, second, third, fourth emotions. But if you're aware of internal events and internal emotion without reacting to them, without attempting to control them or suppress them or being, you know, freaked out by them, if you just allow them to be, you realize that they are transient. Like anything else, it passes. And so you can learn to be aware of it. You can uh, actually hone in on the fact that it's not a static state and that you're, if you really tune into your emotions and your thoughts, you will recognize that from far away, when you're not really looking at it, it may seem like a solid mass. But when you get closer, it actually looks like the way sun looks like when it's dancing on water. As soon as you see it, as soon as you experience an emotion, it's already changing, it's already gone. So your feelings are like any transient experience. As soon as you experience, it's already changing. As soon as you bring your awareness to bear on your some feeling state, it's already gone. And then if you're just aware of the fact that your emotion that would otherwise make you panic is a changing ephemeral state, it stops secondary negative emotions. It stops meta-emotions from compounding the damage. It then dissolves as everything dissolves over time. Questions about that? I think I saw a hand up. Yep. Yeah, so metacognitive therapy is dealing with metacognitive beliefs. 
changing your first order beliefs. I can, I should. Um, cognitive behavior therapy is more on the actual instructions themselves. Here is how to actually focus your attention. Here's how to engage in detached mindfulness. Be aware of your feelings. Be aware of their transience. Be aware that they're changing. And as you zoom in on their changing nature, that stops secondary negative emotions from, from rising. Yeah. All experiences. So the best uh, example for that is looking at light or sunlight on water. As soon as you try to fixate on some pattern, it's gone. As soon as you fixate on another pattern, it's gone. You got to really unfocus your eyes and just be aware of the constant changing nature of what you're seeing or experiencing. And that detaches. I mean, the feeling doesn't totally go away right away, but you're not creating any meta negative meta emotions. You're not angry about being angry. You're not then enraged by the fact that you're angry. It stops this chain of automaticity that would otherwise be like the needle in a record scouring deeper and deeper as it goes goes around so this is a way of understanding that um say for example you have some pattern of emotion think of that as a negative sign there's some negative emotion in your awareness now anything in awareness brings up productions or procedural knowledge that matches to it so you have a negative matches a negative and this creates a greater negative emotion we don't like negative things so this a negative feeling creates another negative feeling which then creates another negative feeling. But if you are aware of the impermanence of the negative feeling, it stops production rules from cropping up. See, these require 50 milliseconds of thinking something's permanent to arise. If you're aware of the impermanence, it stops the matching process from creating secondary negative emotions. And that's the power of uh, being aware of the impermanence of emotions. It takes practice, but it, cuts the automaticity from automatically firing. Yes? Yeah, because of this. Because you have procedural knowledge that arises to match things in your working memory. So you have, so if you have some matching production, like, you know, you're being told, other people have it worse, you know. You ever hear that one? You don't have a right to feel a negative emotion. Other people, oh, thanks for the guilt for being sad now, right? Which makes as much sense as saying you don't have the right to be happy because other people have it better. Doesn't make much sense. Bad software. Bad cultural software. You have a right to feel any negative emotion. But if you're aware of the moment-to-moment -moment impermanence of it, if you're aware of its changing nature, and instead of creating secondary negative emotions that get worse and worse and worse, until you become totally disabled by it. You can then reverse the process and decrease uh, the storehouse of negative emotions until you're free from those. And millions of people have done this. So again, understanding your mind enables you to direct it better. Now there are cognitive behavior therapy techniques, meditation techniques. One effective med meditation technique is called Vipassana. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. But it's a very old medita meditation technique that has been studied by science. It helps people understand uh, and get become experts at uh, detached mindfulness in a way that enables you to empty out the storehouse of negative emotions to uh, increase your abilities. So, knowing your limitations. Metacognitive skills also gives you the ability to understand um, your own limitations. Ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Oh, sorry, I see a hand up. Sorry, yeah, go ahead before we move on. Is that technique you said? Detached mindfulness? The, the meditation technique? It's called Vipassana. So V-I-P-A-S-S-A. -S -S Vipassana means to see things as they really are. So instead of seeing things as permanent, you see things as impermanent, which is actually how they really are. It's the falsely seeing things as permanent that causes a long chain of negative emotions that builds up in your unconscious storehouse. By seeing things as they are, changing, it stops the automatic compounding of negative emotions. And this is a very effective and tried and true way of, of engaging with your own psyche. Go ahead. What is this technique? Is it just a detached one? Not quite. It's two. It's one is increasing your metacognitive sensitivity 
through attention techniques. So if you go to one of those 10-day retreats that a lot of people know about, uh, you, you learn first how to focus your attention so that you can then have a lens that can see deeper into your experience. Because when your mind's very gross and you can't, uh, very broad and you can't detect the, the fine nuances of your inner experience, when your metacognitive sensitivity is low, everything seems like a big mass of unchanging states. As you increase your awareness, your metacognitive sensitivity increases. Um, sort of like if you're suddenly blind, you're not able to read Braille because you don't have the sensitivity to it. But as you gain sensitivity, you're, you're able to understand and uh, you're able to sense the deeper nuance of things. So sort of like that, you gain perceptual access to a, a deeper level of your experience. And so you learn attention first, and then you learn detached mindfulness. You learn over and over again, beware of the impermanence of your experience. Don't identify with, uh, with an emotion. Don't follow a thought just because it seems interesting. And so you're eventually able to keep your awareness clear and focused and refined in a way that empties out the negative storehouse of emotions. You reverse the negative causal chain of automaticity that comes from just system one uh, not liking negative things, and you're able to then um, empty out negative emotions. So here, I'll write on the board, I hear some whispers. So this is one very old technique supposed to be reputed to be the original technique of Buddhism that people were rightly skeptical of, but after decades of being screened through uh, scientific scrutiny, they realized, oh, this is actually a very old psychological technique that enables people to reverse negative causality and in improve positive causality within your, your mental states. It was simply a, a psychological practice that enabled positive emotional states. But it's right to be skeptical at first, but respect the data when it arises. Okay, so system one automaticity can, you know, it doesn't just happen with, with negative states, it also happens with positive states. So if you, a lot of addictions come from, ooh, I have a good feeling, I want more of that. Oh, that good feeling created more good feeling. So you create this meta emotion of wanting more. I want more excellent shows. I want more junk food. I need to have that exact chocolate again and again and again. Every positive emotion, I should have a less time between them. And I need to have that particular experience over and over more and more increase and increase until people can become helpless addicts to to anything. So that's part of the modern world is that it's designed to be addictive. The world we're in right now is uh, an addict creation machine, some people say, where our poor little primate brain that evolved around rare calories, rare entertainment, is now surrounded by lots of calories and lots of entertainment. And this is hijacking our very sensitive neural wiring and causing runaway reinforcement learning to just create negative behaviors that um, seek positive experiences over and over and over until people just can become consumed by them. Yeah, there was a hand up, I think. Well, yeah, good point. Like pleasurable calories, lots of berries, they had a season. And when they were gone, they were gone. Honey <laughs> was a little dangerous to get. So things were expensive to get. Calories were not always around us. There was a time, there was a season for everything. Uh, there was a hunting season. There was a time to be in the sun in the summer because when it gets cold, you don't have indoor heating. So pleasure was more scarce and pain was more abundance or neural wiring uh, created this response, a binge response. Once there's some pleasurable thing there, binge because it's not going to be there forever. You got berries? Eat as many as you can. There's some, some honey. Uh, see if you can find a way to get it. Uh, is there some animals? Try to kill as many as you can because it's not going to be there later. So humans have this binge response. 
uh, or mating or uh, pretty much anything that you can acquire in nature is scarce in its natural environment, but these days it is as abundant as we can get. So it's creating this binge response in the human mind because we were we evolved around scarce resources. And so learning to uh, not give in to compulsive behaviors is probably one of the most important things we can do because it'll hijack your brain, it'll drag you down and keep you there for the rest of your life unless you use system two metacognition. And it may feel good in the, in the short run, but scrolling forever, uh, waking up, falling asleep to your phones, watching shows, eating junk food is a sure way of becoming depressed, as people are finding out. There is an article I put online about how metacognition can help overcome mental health crisis. Basically, this culture we have that's hijacking the learning pathways of our brain can only be overcome by our own states directing themselves. No one's going to intercede in your life for you. There's nobody coming. The cavalry is not coming. No one will just show up and take you by the hand and help you engage in less negative behaviors and more positive behaviors. There's only you and there's only your self-discipline and self-direction that will help you attain your happiest state in the long run. So this includes partly knowing your own weaknesses. This can include controlling your environment. If you can't control yourself in the moment, then control yourself in the long run. For example, if you can't control uh, your automatic pleasure seeking in the moment, such as maybe junk food, don't bring junk food home. I had to do this myself. If I had chips in the cupboard, oh, they were gone. Even a box of crackers. I'll be at the grocery store and I'll say, let's get a few of these every day and I'll just, I'll save it for what I really want it. As soon as I get home, I'll leave a few in the box so I feel good about myself the next day. <laughs> but Automatic behavior can be as easy as eating the whole box of crackers at one time or whatever else you feel addicted to or have this automatic compulsive behavior. So controlling your environment, not keeping your uh, pantries filled with chocolate, sodas, and chips is one way of controlling your environment. Another way is if you feel addicted to something on your phone or the internet, you can't have internet in your house anymore. Or you can have it on a code and keep the code, uh, you know, in your mailbox. And so when you really need the internet, you go grab the code, you delete it, and then you use the internet for a short time. Or you go to cafes. You can also put data blockers on your phone. This is getting increasingly popular. You have a data block on your phone so you can't get the internet. You can use, you know, Wi-Fi at school or coffee shops or whatever. So you're never, you're never without internet, totally. But this is a way of controlling your... Uh, automatic, easy pleasure-seeking system so that you're not doing the equivalent of eating all the junk food in your pantry right away. So there's a way of controlling your environment. This is also called the Odysseus strategy, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, this is a way of avoiding falling into traps of instant gratification by all the entertainment we consume. So we can craft our physical environment to improve our mental welfare. This is the Odysseus strategy. Does anybody know the story of Odysseus? Yeah, you know the story? You know the story of the sirens? Yeah, didn't he like tie himself to the bull? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's the story. So this is the story of uh, some great general trying to get home after a very long journey. That's the story of Odysseus. And he meets all the great wonders of the world. And one of them is when he and his men are out rowing past some islands and he's heard that there are these beautiful maidens that are actually monsters on the island. And they will sing an enchanting song. And sailors will be transfixed by this beautiful song and will helplessly be lured to their death. They'll just jump off the boat to try to get to these maidens and drown. The sound of the, the, sound of the sirens. But Odysseus, they knew they had to go past the islands to get home. So he ordered his men to put wax in their ears so they couldn't hear the sound. But he was really wanting to hear the sound. But he knew that his automaticity would uh, hypnotize him. That the, He knew that he would be consumed by the, the sound of the sirens. He didn't trust himself to control his behavior in the moment, so he ordered his men to tie his hands to the mast. 
And he told them, no matter how much I struggle, no matter how much I order you to untie me, don't untie me until we're past the danger. And so this is what happened. You had them row past the island with the beautiful monsters that sung their siren song. The men kept rowing, they didn't hear it. But as soon as Odysseus heard it, he started struggling against his bonds. He struggled against his bonds and he struggled with all his might and he yelled at his men to untie me, untie me. And he almost ripped his own arms off trying to get to them. But eventually they moved past the danger. He regained his senses and he was well again. So he uh, cast his mind into the future and he knew that he wouldn't be able to overcome his automaticity. And so he metacognitively controlled his environment to uh, overcome his initial pleasure seeking. And so we can do this with the things we can't control in the moment, whether it's don't keep food or alcohol in your home. Um, no, maybe don't spend time around people who do hard drugs. Uh, if your phone is in addiction that you have a love hate relationship with, you can put a data block on your phone eh, for a certain time of the day. You can, you can go online, uh, to your, the website and you can click on a data block and block your internet so that no matter how many, how hard you struggle against that data block, you will not gain internet. You can always go to the, to a, a cafe or get some public Wi-Fi, uh, or you can unplug your internet at your home so that when you use the internet, you actually need to use it. You go to a cafe, you are very deliberate about it. You go to a university where you're around people so that you don't binge on whatever addictive behavior, or you can just use simple distraction blocker softwares so that you don't go, you know, to a meme website or whatever, uh, you know, YouTube or whatever you spend your time on. So this is the Odysseus strategy. It's a metacognitive technique for overcoming automatic negative uh, processes that we can't control in the moment. Because the animal part of our brain is very strong and the human part of our brain is very new. And as much as we like to think that we are totally in control of ourselves, the history of our behavior shows that we ain't nothing but mammals. And we can quickly binge on positive seeming things that are actually negative in the long run. So, for example, uh, our cousins, different apes, they don't have system two, but they have a system one type metacognition where monkeys demonstrate the ability to, uh, to seek information when they know they don't know something. They can uh, gamble sensibly. I'll talk about that in a second. They have some awareness of mental states. They can't conceptually really think about their mental states, but they can be aware of an emotion, and try to control it if they, they know it's not good in the moment. If they know that there's a monkey of a higher hierarchy, uh, if there's a monkey in the higher rung of the hierarchy, they'll know, don't steal its food. Don't, you know, try to steal its mate. Uh, try to hide your own food from it. So this correlates with system one metacognition, which is non-conceptual monitoring, and in some, in some cases, a non-conceptual control of, of one's own mental states. So, for example, um, there is a metacognitive test they, that, they, that they give monkeys where uh, monkeys can do math tests, right? So you give monkeys these tokens, little chips that they can bet, like poker chips. If it gets a math question right, it can wager on how well it knows, and it'll get a treat if it gets the question right. So monkeys will do a, you know, some sort of math test, and if they know they know, they'll bet all their chips to get that big treat. And if they know they don't know, they'll only bet a little bit or not at all because they know they don't know. So this is a very simple way of, of understanding that, that monkeys and other animals have at least some way of monitoring their own mental states. They don't want to bet everything when they know that they're not very knowledgeable about something. Or they'll even ask a researcher for a hint in their, you know, cute little way. 
So other animals have precursors to metacognition. Um, monkeys, rats, pigeons, even dolphins. Dolphins will do tests for fish. And when they know the answer, they'll get really excited. Before they are allowed to answer, they'll get really excited because they know they know. They know they're going to get that. They know they're going to get that fish. Other animals, not so much. Usually social animals. Why social animals? Why would social animals have metacognition of a, of a, of a higher rate? Any guesses? There's a few guesses. Can you go ahead? You're first. Social hierarchy? Absolutely. You need metacognition to represent the minds of others. There are researchers who think that our ability for metacognition to represent our own minds came from the need to represent the minds of others. So there were two researchers who published a paper with a very simple question back in 1978. Does a chimpanzee have a theory of mind? Theory of mind meaning, can it represent the mental states of others? Now, chimpanzees, bonobos, other apes and monkeys seem to have this ability for meta-representation in a small way, in a, in a very uh, low-level way. They can do, in a small way, system two metacognition without the actual control. They can have a sense of how somebody else thinks. They can't really represent their own minds in, in the exact same way, but they can represent the minds of others. They know when another monkey is angry. They know um, that if they steal the food from a monkey that's lower on the social hierarchy, that'll be fine. There probably will be no danger. That monkey will get angry and attack them. So this ability to meta-represent the thoughts in general, some researchers think came from the social environment of certain animals, whether you were a dolphin, being able to represent the minds of other dolphins, it's a good idea. It enables you to hunt and defend yourself in packs. Pods, right? Okay. Uh, whether you're, uh, even some, some birds that hunt in packs have a better ability to meta-represent. So to coordinate your behavior, to have harmonious group dynamics requires at least some coordination of behavior. That requires of thoughts that refer to the thoughts of others. And as humans evolved in social hierarchies and in social groups, we have this very high level meta representing ability, is how the, uh, the narrative goes. Yep. Isn't this just like sociology? Like, it's not mind reading, it's just like say. Uh huh. So, sociology is the study of society, culture, and uh, how human beings interact in a social group. So that's the study of that in general and all the different phenomena. Mind reading is the particular cognitive attribute of representing the aboutness of other people's thoughts. So the husband says, of course I care about how you imagined I thought you perceived I wanted you to feel. How much meta-representing is going on there? Da -da 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 -da. Tricky. Yeah. But... When you're in a relationship, people want to know that the other person cares. They want to represent that person's thoughts. And a lot of time goes into trying to mind read, to try to guess how much that person likes me, cares about me. And that person is trying to think, uh, what are your intentions with them? In the long run, is your intention to marry? Is your intention just to have a, you know, a short relationship or just getting to know you? how committed, how, and so this is one other reason why mind reading would develop, was because, uh, you know, partners would want to represent how committed the other person is before they invest all their, um, all their resources, time, and, and genetic chips, so to speak. So it is a, an important uh, evolutionary uh, strategy that has profound selective benefit. Okay. I'll take a few minutes of questions, if there's any questions. All good? Yeah, go ahead. Can I explain the meta level and object level? Yes, I can. Here. Object level is external. 
meta level, internal. So if your thoughts are about something external to you, your concepts are about the street you're driving down, that's a red light, that means stop, green light means go, object level. If your thoughts are referring to your own thoughts, I'm really tired to be driving right now. I'm really upset. I need to focus on the road more. Meta level. So, um, the next class will be about mind reading and other things involving the group, social strategy, how to understand the thoughts of others to create a more harmonious relationship, uh, world, and what are the cognitive attributes that humans evolved that enable us to understand and engage with each other beneficially. So you can have a great break, get some rest, do something fun, and uh, I will see you soon. I'll be here for any questions.